Okay, so it's exactly 9.10. I think we should start. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you finally, not in person, but with picture. And it's my great pleasure to uh, host this panel on culture and literature. My name is Nelia Lanamit. I am a visiting research scholar at the Nazarian Center of Israel Studies in UCLA. I come from Israel. Um, I studied in Tel Aviv and Haifa Universities, and I've worked in the Seminal Kibbutzim, those of you who know it. Uh, we have a great audience here and panelists from different parts of the world. We have people from England and Russia and uh, Tel Aviv and um, the U.S. Um, so we're all around. We have Maura in Los Angeles. I'm right now in Washington. Um, so it's great to see you all. Uh, our panel is particularly interesting because we have issues on literature and representation and identity and translation and dance. So this will be a very uh, exciting panel. And uh, without further ado, let us start. Uh, we will begin with Jessica Binks. Uh, let me read your bio. Okay. So Jessica Binks has completed her BA in Arabic and Hebrew at the University of Cambridge, during which she specialized in modern literature. In her final year dissertation, she explored how mentions of the Holocaust in contemporary Lebanese and Palestinian literature could be understood through the concept of Levantinism. So Jessica, please, you have 10 minutes and then we'll leave 10 minutes for Q&A. Good luck. Hi, um, bear with me a sec, because this is the first time I've uh, done this on Zoom. So I... Uh... Let us know if you need help with the presentation, we'd be happy to help. Yeah, how do I, how do I share? Okay, uh, I have found them. And you now see? We see your presentation very well. Okay. Mm. Now I don't see my presentation very well. Okay, there we go. Um, so today I would like to talk to you about Levantinism as a literary tool. Um, so this is actually, this paper is a continuation of my undergraduate dissertation, which I wrote about um, contemporary Arabic fiction, and I focused on Lebanese and Palestinian authors who are talking about the Holocaust um, and how they're able to negotiate the right to do that and to go beyond uh, what we would usually consider theirs to tell. Um, so I hope you will see that in my now talking about Israeli literature um, I'm trying to do more than just talk about some in the air concept of Levantinism, but actually see how can we apply it? Um, how can we compare Arabic and Hebrew literature in a fruitful way? So what am I going to talk to you about? Um, what am I going to talk about to you today? Uh, first, I'm going to give you a definition of Levantinism. And uh, while you might have some idea like that this is a kind of intuitive term, it's actually meant different things at different points in history. So I'm going to clarify what those are. Uh, then I'm going to go on to problematize the concept of Levantinism as it's being used today, because although in contemporary scholarship, it's very much um, being used to write back to colonial and orientalist ideas about the Levant, uh, it nonetheless has its own problems. Um, and then I'm going to tell you, use that as a springboard to tell you why I nonetheless think that Levantinism can offer us a very enriching way of talking about literature from the region. Um, and finally, I'm just going to briefly introduce to you two books that I looked at in my paper, because um, I think uh, my literary analysis is probably better on paper than as a presentation. Um, and these are and the, and the Bride Closed the Door by Ronit Matalon and Arabesques um, by Anton Chemas. Um, and these are both texts written by minority authors, which I think is the key here that uh, Levantinism can really offer us a way to understand minorities who don't fit into conventional national narratives so well. Um, and yeah, so that answers why I read these novels as Levantine texts. So the origins of Levantinism. First of all, for those of you who aren't sure, uh, the region of the Levant is usually uh, the region that includes Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, and Egypt, and can sometimes be expanded to include Cyprus, Greece, Turkey, Libya, and Iraq. Um, 
And the term Levantine was actually originally used to describe Europeans living in the Levant, so namely foreigners. Um, and it was only later, around the time of Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798, that the term instead became a derogatory term uh, used to describe locals of the region of mixed or minority backgrounds. And in this iteration, the term evoked hybridity, mimicry, and a lack of authenticity. So the idea that these people neither belong to the East nor the West, and later during the age of nation states, that they also didn't belong to the national narrative. They sort of lay outside of it. Hmm. Why? So one of the first people to uh, talk about Levantinism in a positive way and to rewrite the story of what it meant to be a Levantine was Jacqueline Kahanov. Jacqueline Kahanov was an Israeli writer who was born in Egypt to Tunisian and Iraqi parents, and she was educated in French. So you can begin to imagine why someone like her would want a positive way of describing her composite heritage um, and would want to start to reanalyze this notion that, for example, uh, having the ability of multilingualism was somehow a confused defect and say, no, actually, this enriches my life and this is a skill. Uh, and her essay cycle, The Generation of Levantines, has been highly influential in contemporary scholarship. So in today's scholarship, Levantinism is becoming a bit of a buzzword um, and it sort of stands in for the idea of pluralism, accounting for minorities, fluidity, flexibility, adaptability, and resourcefulness. Um, and to give you a couple of examples, um, Frank Salami, who's a Lebanese scholar living in Boston, uh, recently wrote a book called The Other Middle East, in which he talks about uh, he gives a literary study of works from across the region, analyzing them in terms of Levantinism or how they're Levantine. And he defines Levantinism as being at home with everything and being at one with everyone all the time and all at once. Meanwhile, Israeli scholar Gil Hochberg, who has talked extensively about Kahanov's writings, um, describes Levantinism as a state of in-betweenness, which is always arrived at by a process of loss, the loss of national affiliation, racial slash ethnic purity and cultural authenticity. Um, and she has written about this in detail in her recent book, In Spite of Partition. Um, and as you can see, these definitions vary slightly. Maybe the first one is a bit more focused on the strength of the individual, whereas the second is more about the difficulties faced by the individual. Uh, but nonetheless, they have in common this idea of a lack of belonging, a feeling of uprootedness, fluidity, movement, change. Um, so I think that's really what uh, Levantinism in today's scholarship is being used to mean. Um, and as well as individuals' academic studies, there's also two journals dedicated to conceptualizing the Levant, and these are Contemporary Levant and the Journal of Levantine Studies, um, which are taking papers from all of the countries in the region and outside of it, and yeah, trying to realize this concept as something active. And they actually state their mission on their website, um, and they say, Reconceptualization of the Levant as a useful category of analysis and classification could problematize and possibly reshape conceptual maps of the region by taking various subaltern perspectives into consideration and posit the Levant as an active agent rather than as a passive object. And it's this last point that I'd really like to focus on, because throughout the history of the Levant, there hasn't really been a moment when the Levantines have been able to define who they are for themselves. Uh, since the age of the nation state, which was very much created by colonial powers, uh, people have been divided by others and have been told what their identity is by others. So the concept of, the, of Levantinism can really offer a way to rewrite uh, history from inside the region. Um, however, nonetheless, there are some problems with this idea of Levantinism as this glorious thing where we can all cross borders and be free. Um, and um, one of these 
is, as Ice and Wigan point out in their study, um, they actually criticize uh, the writings of Salame and Hochberg that we've uh, just looked at, um, saying that these writers have nostalgic and sentimental tendencies, namely that focusing on a golden age of pluralism and cosmopolitanism at the ex uh, instead of talking about uh, the contradictory histories lived by people and ideas of entanglement. Uh, so they say that Levantinism is a fruitful tool, but it needs to be framed in the correct way that acknowledges difficulty. Um, then another problem we might face, particularly in Kahanov's writings, is as Deborah Starr points out, um, the fact that colonialism is kind of being inverted. So uh, in Kahanov's writings, Starr says, Levantinism functionally replaces one colonial discourse, Ashkenazi hegemony in Israel, with another, Levantine cultural superi superiority over Arabs. So namely, in Kahanov's iteration of Levantinism, the minority, uh, and in her case, this sort of uh, culturally cultural elite educated class, is actually uh, being prioritized over the majority and over other cultures, as opposed to including it into something larger. And one final thing uh, that we could see as a problem is that this focus on fluidity and movement can at times come at the expense of localized narratives. So when we talk about migration and diasporas and so on, we're actually not uh, remembering that for many individuals who maybe even themselves embody uh, in, have this embodiment of mixed heritage and so on, uh, movement is very often not possible. And uh, these people are very often trapped in their status as a minority. Um, so uh, now I'm just briefly going to tell you why I've chosen these two novels to look at. The first of which is Arabesques, which was written in 1986 by Anton Chamas. Um, and Shamas is a Christian Israeli-Palestinian and one of the few ever Israeli-Palestinians um, and certainly one of the first to have written in Hebrew, uh, which was a very controversial choice uh, because he knew when he was writing that his work was not going to be liked by the readership he was writing it to, yet he chose to do this nonetheless. And this was very much part of a new form of nationalism that he wanted to create, which would acknowledge... Um, rather than a religious meaning to what it is to be Israeli, instead a geographical meaning so that everyone who was in the area uh, had an equal stake in uh, la language and cultural and et cetera issues. And uh, yeah, so I think that his novel, which was the only novel he ever wrote and an autobiographical novel that goes between different modes of writing um, can really be understood better in terms of Levantinism um, because it, although it's sort of made it into the Israeli canon just because the Israeli canon is, in, is so young and uh, small in scope, it's also sort of lies outside of the canon and hasn't really been accepted into and certainly not by Israeli critics at the time of Shamas's writing. Um, and then the second work is And the Bride Closed the Door by Ronit Matalon. Um, and this is Matalon's last novella. And Matalon uh, was born to Egyptian parents. And unlike Shamas, who tries to create a very overt image of uh, Levantinism and pluralism and so on, uh, Matalon sort of is talking about Levantinism by depicting the opposite in the same way that uh, she very much in her work focuses on feminism by depicting its suppression. Um, so she's, uh, in a way, uh, Starr has categorized her as belonging to a post-Levantine generation, namely that her parents were from Egypt, uh, yet she grew up in Israel and so has really to struggle to retain her heritage um, and and what she depicts in her novella is very much yes this uh, tendency towards amnesia that she's trying to resist and in conclusion I would like to say that why I think Levantinism offers 
uh, such a useful framing lens is precisely because it resists amnesia and memorialization at the same time. So while in the media today, there's a huge tendency towards amnesia uh, in which what we see in the news uh, today, we've forgotten about by tomorrow. Um, and this makes it very hard to uh, see how there's any connecting thread between events. Um, likewise, there's a tendency in history textbooks or in national narratives as they're officially told towards memorialization, um, namely that we see, we acknowledge history, history and we remember it, but we don't bring it into conversation with the pe present. We see it as something that has passed and happened and that we're disconnected from. Uh, and I, I think that Levantinism, by depicting the character of the Levantine as uprooted in some way, makes these roots constantly visible. We are constantly forced to see the roots and to see uh, to, to see that how history connects to the present and that it hasn't gone away. Um, and yes, that's all I have to say. Um, I hope that I have stuck within the time because I've lost sight of my clock. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Jessica. This was intriguing. Um, very beautifully presented. I know we corresponded before and you told me it's your first presentation, so bravo. And uh, we'll continue. Okay, so our left, next presenter is Danila Golubev. Danila is a fourth year student at the Moscow State University Department of Jewish Studies. His scientific interest is American Jewish diaspora studies to which his research work is devoted. Danila has participated in different scientific conferences held under his university. So Danila, please. Yeah. Um, to begin with, I want to say that, uh, that I'm very glad to participate in this great conference and it's a great honor for me. Uh, so my work is about American Jewish identity in the Great Depression era through discourse on Israel. And um, the American Jewish, the modern American Jewish diaspora as we have it now, and uh, the modern American Jewish identity were formed mostly throughout the Great Depression era. And um, the interval of 15 years between 1924, which is known as uh, when the Immigration Act, Johnson Reed Act came into force in 1939, when the Second World War began, is known as um, the era of American Jews Americanization. And this conception fitted even intellectual Jewish circles at the beginning of 20s. For example, we can remember some works of Mordechai Zoltes. There are a good example of it. And um, it is very interesting because we can see that uh, Jews at this time stood in front of problem of self-identification and there were a lot of white and blue colors among them, Jews from Germany, from Eastern Europe, from and uh, Jews of one um, new generation, which was born um, in the USA. At first, I will explain the importance and the significance of American Jewish um, identity in case of Israel. Then I will get to the problem of uh, defining American Jewish identity. And then um, further throughout this work, I will try not to define, but to uh, describe the conditions where American Jewish identity was formed. Uh, so to begin with, um, I will explain uh, the great significance. Um, the first, first of all, American Jewish identity, uh, American Jewish diaspora, I'm sorry, uh, have been one of two greatest, biggest, and the most important uh, Jewish centers of uh, Jewish life in a whole on the same level with, with Israel since the second half of the 20th century. The second reason answering this great significance is that um, uh, the, the fact that American Jewish um, identity is important in case of uh, Israeli history and uh, in case of Israeli identity. Uh, without a doubt, American Jewish diaspora influenced on the foundation of uh, Israel and uh, on the world of the Israelis as well. Um, sorry, next slide, ah, yeah. Um, uh, why do we treat American? Uh, yeah. So, and um, 
there is one problem of defining American Jewish identity. Uh, Jews in the USA were under the influence of three different cultures. The first culture of their parents, which was brought from Europe, the second culture of the society that surrounded Jews, American culture, and an absolutely new culture, which uh, showed up because of insolvency and inferiority of both previous cultures. And Vladimir Nabokov, with his uh, different works of immigration period, come to mind in this case, uh, there can be distinctly um, defined uh, author's identification within uh, his books with uh, the third person. Uh, I will ex explain this conception. There is an environment and the third person um, and a human being, but this human being doesn't feel as a part of this environment and he doesn't feel as a part of the culture and uh, of the society that he has left. He is the third person and his portrait is very vague and unclear even for himself. And uh, this uh, third person of this conception uh, was um, part of a lot of uh, Jewish homes along the USA in the Great Depression. Um, and in this work, because of this problem, I will try not to define, but to describe these conditions of forming, uh, of these identities forming. So let's begin with the outlook of political uh, sphere, political life of Jewish communities within, within and beyond its borders. There is one tendency among the USA Jewish diaspora's members to vote for the Democratic Party. And this tendency dates back to the Great Depression period. Uh, Jews voted for Democratic Party presidential candidate, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, due to his New Deal program. But uh, nevertheless, um, there is one thing that can be interpreted as a point of attractiveness, of uh, connection, of contact for um, two Jewish centers of uh, two different continents. And uh, this is an ambiguity of two governmental policy that policies that fit both for the USA and for the diaspora uh, in Middle East. Um, Roosevelt's small steps on influencing on the German Nazi party uh, and his unwillingness to uh, open the borders for um, Jews in for Jews of Europe. Uh, with um, different actions of Great Britain, for example, white papers, or also they are known as white books, uh, disappointed Jews from the USA and Jews in the Middle East. And uh, the second characteristic feature uh, that is worth mentioning, that is very important, is valuable and regular assistance uh, to the community on the future territories of Israel and eventually to Israel itself. Despite the fact that uh, this assistance can be tracked since the second half of the 19th century, uh, more significant, organized, and more centralized, it became only in the Great Depression era. Uh, it happened due to different factors and different personalities, and Abba Hilo Silver, one of uh, Jewish diaspora leaders, is worth mentioning with his actions and intention to help to solve the problem, which was spreading all over Europe, uh, and uh, to um, help Jews to immigrate to safe territories, to the territories of uh, the state Israel. Uh, but at the same time, besides the influence of different personalities, Jewish federations itself are um, worth mentioning, uh, despite the fact that um, we can see their existence, but to tell the truth in less developed form since the beginning of the 20th century, they were not so popular among uh, diaspora members because they had to compete with other organizations that had gained uh, the reputation before them. And these organiza organizations that Jewish federations competed with failed utterly because of financial difficulties at the beginning of uh, the world economic crisis. Uh, next characteristic feature that is worth mentioning is inclusion of uh, Jews into the surrounding American society. The borders between diaspora and um, environment were more transparent and sometimes they were broken um, they were completely destroyed. During the Great Depression, Jews began to get out of their traditional habitual uh, regions where they used to settle for a long time. They literally began to open uh, to their surrounding uh, society to dive into social, political, and economical life on the national level. At this time emerged absolutely new generation uh, born in the immigrants' families, but this time in the USA. Uh, during the crisis, uh, Jewish youth was on its own and the influence on them uh, from their parents began to decrease. And uh, this generation suits one term, uh, Americanization. To explain uh, it, we can take a look at different processes that took place within Jewish households at this time in the USA uh, to understand this generation. Um, so... Um, family hierarchy exposed to different changes, women uh, more often took um, a role of breadwinner. Um, women uh, get jobs in different spheres, for example, in clerical jobs, as teachers, in light industries. 
And at the same time, authority of husband began to uh, decrease in households. Uh, it was connected with the um, inner problems because a lot of um, male diaspora members took job loss as their personal defeat. Uh, uh, they felt ashamed and thought that they were a burden uh, to their families. High tensions pulled out into different quarrels and conflicts, and this new generation tried to avoid it, tried to escape. Um, and uh, this new generation absorbed traditions, took a worldview of um, the society that surrounded Jewish diaspora. A lot of young Jews escaped and cut all the ties with diaspora, but at the same time, a lot of adolescents uh, took responsibility for the family's sake and took the burden of breadwinner as well, uh, along with women. Uh, even though, um, but um, if we take a look uh, at the economic life of uh, Jewish diaspora at this time, we can see a lot of discrepancies. Um, even though a lot of Jews didn't have uh, difficulties within the whole period, they felt very unstable. They didn't feel uh, certainty uh, about their future. And it happened because of increasing level of anti-Semitism and a myth that the Great Depression was none other than uh, the result of Jewish conspiracy because at this time, a lot of Jews were accused to be communists. Uh, moreover, both communities in, um, on the future state of Israel, on the territories of future state Israel, and uh, in the USA had to deal with increased level of anti-Semitism, and both governments tried to uh, stop it and route the situation into the peaceful route, of course, but neither the USA nor Great Britain really succeeded in it. And this was also one more point of attractiveness for two Jewish um, centers. Uh, talking about uh, different ideologies, uh, for example, communism or socialism, we can see that socialism was very popular conception, not only in the Northern America Jewish communities, but also in the promised land due to a large number of immigrants from Eastern Europe who were moving forward socialist ideas. And this conception that was shared by two Jewish communities made the USA more attractive to Israel. Now, uh, after taking a look at the conditions within and beyond American Jewish diaspora in the Great Depression period, we can see that despite the fact that between two different uh, Jewish centers were more than 100 kilometers, um, they had their closeness, their integration and unity can be traced through historical, social, political, economic, and even psychological aspects. Oh, sorry. Uh, these two Jewish communities, <laughs> communities uh, began to uh, function as one single, single organism, and uh, they were integrated and connected with each other. And despite the fact that the Great Depression occurred in the USA, um, this world economic crisis influenced on the whole Jewry and uh, on um, the formation, crystallization of uh, American Jewish identity and on the Israeli identity as well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Danila, and thank you for being very, very accurate with time. This was very interesting and uh, I really like the image of the two lungs. We will talk about it in the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so we will move on to our next presenter, uh, Sabrina Alcala Soleno, studies at the University of Texas at El Paso. She's a senior majoring in political science with a focus on international politics and a minor in intelligence and national security studies. She's hoping to continue her studies and earn her master's in economics. So good luck to you, Sabrina, and we're eager to hear about Israeli dance and Zionism. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so let me start sharing my screen. Okay, so my presentation will essentially be about Zionism and Jewish and Israeli identities through performance. Um, before I start my presentation, I do want to note that this presentation is inspired by my research that I did in part of a class collaborative paper. And so for my presentation, I will be presenting a choreographic analysis of the performance titled Possessing to advance my argument. Okay. So my research on the paper focuses on the dance piece Possessing by Israeli choreographer Shira Eviatar and Hadara Huvia. In Possessing, the artist Eviatar and Ahuvia showcase cultural and physical differences between them based on their ethnic heritage. By incorporating traditional folk dance and song, as well as by performing in the nude, 
the choreographer's vulnerability is exposed in the performance. Through dance, they convey the generational transmission of Zionism in their bodies, opening a discussion about the cultural and political implications that Zionism has in present day. Using a choreographic analysis and a conversation with the choreographers as my methods, I discussed the complex effects that Zionism has on Israeli identities. And I argued that possessing can help us illuminate some crucial aspects of the history of Israel and possible future trajectories. So about the artist, um, Shira Eviatar is on the left of the picture and then Hadara Huvia is on the right. Independent Israeli choreographers, Shira Eviatar and Hadara Huvia came together in the 2019 performance titled Possessing to open a discussion about appropriation and settler colonialism in relation to Zionism and folk dance. Eviatar is based in Tel Aviv, Jaffa, utilizes Arab Mizrahi dance aesthetics and is a third generation Mizrahi Israeli. In contrast, Ahuvia comes from a family of kibbutz founders, is based in Brooklyn, New York, and is trained in Israeli folk dance, drawing from her Ashkenazi Jewish culture. So, possessing is a complex performance that represents the cultural and corporeal differences between the bodies of the two artists as an Ashkenazi and a Mizrahi, as well as the innate connection they share towards the Israeli nation state. The performance begins with both Eviatar and Ahuvia in the nude, displaying a clear and political vulnerability on the stage, all the while the title of the piece also engages in a statement of ownership over the body. The nudity in the piece from beginning to end shows how the narratives of Zionism have shaped the artist's bodies through generations of inherited culture, and throughout the piece, Eviatar and Ahuvia focus on showing us the differences between them, not just in their dance, but in their corporeality as well. And then here are some still photos of the performance. As mentioned, the piece starts off with Eviatar and Ahuvia nude on stage. They face their heads towards each other, therefore covering their whole body while verbally presenting their different backgrounds, where they come from, where they live, and their relationships, and thus establishing their distinct identities to the audience. Although they point out their different backgrounds, from afar you can't help but notice that they're pretty similar. They both are youthful, able-bodied with curly hair, and the only noticeable difference is Shira's deep brown curly hair and Hadar's golden brown curls. The artists move on the stage in a clockwise motion, still covering their faces one in front of the other, appearing to signal who is speaking throughout their introduction. They both speak about Jewishness and not understanding what this concept is because of their different experiences. Hadad creates choreography based off folk dances from her mother's Israeli Ashkenazi side, and Eviatar creates work about the folk dances from her father's mother's Ashkenazi Moroccan Arab side. I mean, sorry, Moroccan Arab side. During the introduction, Ahuvia states that her research of Ashkenazi dances and the appropriation of Yemenites, Jews, and Palestinians constructs the Zionist body. Ahuvia recognizes that there is oppression and colonialism embedded in these folk dances. There is land theft. It is at this point in the dance where Ahuvia and Eviatar speak of their histories. Ahuvia notes that her grandfather was one of the main founders of Bet Hashita, a kibbutz in northern Israel that displaced more than 200 Arabs who lived and worked on the same land. Eviatar, on the other hand, tells how her family and others had no choice in their settlement within the state. Ahuvia uses different parts of her anatomy to draw imaginary lines in order to pinpoint where her grandparents from both sides come from. Eviatar assists in holding these points for her so Ahuvia can connect all the lines and trace them back to the center of her body where her ancestry, ancestry meets and breaks her. Now, Eviatar does the same with the assistance of Ahuvia, revealing not only the difference in migration patterns and backgrounds, but also a shared connection to Israel. Eviatar and Ahuvia still facing each other, cover their faces, lower their bodies to the ground on their side in a fetal-like position, then extend their bodies out in a straight arrow and drop face down to the floor. They continue to do these motions all over the, um, traveling all over the stage, signifying the both of the people's, um, 
pretty much their experience in Israel, in the territory. The lights in the studio dim to focus on Eviatar and Ahuvia as they begin a new motion. They walk backwards to gather momentum before walking towards each other with open arms. Though they do not embrace each other, they make a connection with the front of their bodies before retreating again and repeating the motion. The scene intensifies and the two bodies resonate a loud whack as they connect, a sound that only a naked body unconfined by articles of clothing could make. The performance continues with, with both Eviatar and Ahuvia performing Arab and Mizrahi and Ashkenazi folk dances, respectively. Ahuvia kicks her legs out and swings them back in high energy while performing Israeli folk dance motions around the stage as Eviatar moves her entire body up and down and side to side in a snake-like motion while mostly using lower body and hip and shoulder movements. Both Eviatar and Ahuvia use these dances to materialize the presence of Zionism and traditional Israeli folk dancing, as well as their own specific bodies. Israeli folk dance assumes Zionism as an idea that has an innate ownership of their body, whether the bodies agree to it or not. The rich history that has been passed down through these folk dances has also brought Zionism along with it by way of culture and embedded itself into their identities. Eviatar and Ahuvia's bodies protest that they do not want Zionism to possess their bodies. Rather, they want ownership of their bodies. They denounce the ideology, all the while accepting that it is also culturally inherent. In an interview about the performance, Ahuvia states, there is subtext that is folded into the Ashkenazi Israeli folk dance, how Zionism is expressed and practiced by American Jews. Eviatar, on the other hand, acknowledges the wrongs of the past, and the road to reparations. She says, we wear our past, it's in our dances and body language. So anything that we would wear is in the past and the work of change is in the present. And then there's the still picture of them sitting down both. So they're pretty much so showing um, solidarity between two Jewish women from different backgrounds, one Mizrahi and one Ashkenazi, um, sharing a space where they protest against Zionism. And then I just want to say that possessing can facilitate a discussion on the political and social history of Israel by acknowledging faults in the dispossession and the loss of homeland of many Arabs within the territory through the simultaneous perspective of an Israeli Ashkenazi and Israeli and Mizrahi woman. The performance involves both Eviatar and Ahuvia's connection to Israel, Israeli culture, as well as the possession that Zionism has on their corporeality due to generations of settler colonialism, appropriation, and influence. Dance in particular has been an integral part of Israeli culture and religious, national, and communal celebrations as a staple of the national and cultural consciousness. Eviatar and Ahuvia understand that dance is an integral part of their identity, and although they do not accept Zionism, and rather challenge it, they acknowledge that it is a part of their identity, which has marginalized and displaced hundreds of thousands of people. Possessing is a form of present resistance to the Zionist ideology. And then I just want to say that this work was inspired by a collaborative class paper titled Mobilizing Memory, Post-World War II Performance Inquiries in Jewish Women's Identities under Dr. Melissa Malpignano's course, Jewish and Israeli Identities and Dance Performance at the University of Texas at El Paso. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Wow. <laughs> thank you for doing, you know, limiting yourself to the time and thank you for a very um, awakening presentation. Um, I have many questions, but we'll leave them to the end, of course. Um, and we will move on. So our final presenter is Ohad Zeltzer Zubida, a student at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Tel Aviv University, where he also works as a research and teaching assistant. Ohad, <coughs> sorry, Ohad is a regular contributed, contributor of book reviews for Haaretz books, has written original essays on cinema, criticism, interpretation, and identity for print and online platforms, and his original fiction has been published in 
Granta Magazine. He is a co-host of the Promised Podcast, a leading English language podcast on Israeli politics, society, and culture. So, Ohad, please. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to the other panel members for uh, illuminating uh, presentations. I'll share my presentation. I'll take a sip of water and I'll begin. Can everybody see my slide? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I see you nodding. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, okay. So uh, the title of, my, of the paper of the presentation that uh, I'll be sharing with you today is Found in Translation, Nationalism and Cultural Repertoires of Loyalty in Translation Discourse. So in my presentation, I, I hope to show that in the Israeli context, questions of translation inevitably lead to questions of nationality. To this end, I propose a concept of translation, not only as a profession or as a literary practice, but as a social practice as well. Uh, I wish to spotlight the cultural and social conditions in which the discursive criteria employed in reading and evaluating translations are produced and the ways in which changes in the conditions coincide with the substantive changes in the discourse uh, over time. So uh, I'll demonstrate my argument by examining book reviews about translated fiction published in the literary supplements of Israeli newspapers across two different time periods, uh, 1955 and 2015. Uh, I'll first show the change in scope of translation discourse uh, in book reviews. Then I'll turn to changes in substance of translation discourse. And finally, I'll try to integrate my quantitative and qualitative findings by arguing that the discursive changes can help explain uh, the changes in scope. So I'll argue uh, in essence that uh, loyalty as a criterion of evaluation exposes the diffusion, this diffusion that you can see in this graph, uh, between literary and national frames of meaning in translation discourse and show how changes in the national context are reflected in changes in what may seem as purely literary discourse. So the theoretical bridge that I offer between the literary and social aspects of translation uh, is cultural repertoires of evaluation as coined by uh, Lamont and uh, Thevenot. Uh, these are socially available systems of meaning drawn upon by actors in order to assess and evaluate various uh, phenomena uh, in their world. Now, in, in this specific study, cultural repertoires take on uh, further significance as the actors in question are professional evaluators. Uh, they evaluate their work is to evaluate uh, other things and other work. So I think this is an excellent field to take a look at, uh, at evaluation and criteria of evaluation. So method. The study is based on data collected from the two aforementioned periods of interest and four weekly literary supplements. Uh, I worked with 168 items, 168 book reviews uh, in 1955 uh, with the supplements Massa and Tarbut and in 2015 with the supplements Shabbat and uh, Sfarim. So upon compiling the reviews, I first set out to establish a quantitative understanding, as I said, of the translation discourse they contain. So to operationalize the, the scope of the discourse, I tallied the, numbers of, the number of reviews about translated fiction, which directly mentioned the translation of the work under review. Uh, I didn't consider length or substance at this point. I just tallied every piece that uh, referred to the translation at all. Then I calculated the number of reviews that mentioned the translation as a percent of all reviews so I could get a relative uh, amount. And then I aggregated by period. Once I had the scope, I went on to substance. And uh, in order to, to analyze this substance, I performed thick readings of the mentions of translation, of the places in which uh, reviewers write about the translations of the books under review. So findings. The first and most dramatic finding uh, is this one. Uh, I found that the relative scope of translation discourse in the literary supplements uh, decreased by almost half between 1955 and 2015. As, as you can see here uh, in the table, um, the sharp rise in the number of reviews, along with a very moderate rise in the number of reviews that mentioned the translation between the two years, uh, result in a very dramatic drop in the relative amount of mentions from 60% in 1955 to 34% in uh, 2015. 
this finding clearly indicates that in the 60 year period under review, uh, Israel saw a great reduction in the relative scope of translation discourse in book reviews, or in simpler terms, when writing about translated fiction, reviewers mentioned the translation itself much less in 2015 than in 1955. Now, in order to explain the decrease, I want to offer a substantive look at the data itself. So this may seem trivial or banal, but I think it's important to say that the overwhelming majority of these mentions that I sampled uh, are evaluations of quality. They can be sorted into two main categories. Yes, uh, negative, positive, good, bad, translation, good, translation, bad. Uh, and the main criterion uh, I found for this evaluation is loyalty. Uh, I offer that loyalty is evaluated on two main axes. Uh, the first axis is loyalty to the source text, and the second axis is loyalty to the target language. Uh, in other words, uh, when critics write about the translation of a certain work of literary fiction, it's almost always in order to praise its loyalty or criticize its disloyalty, in some cases both. I think that these axes are interesting. I can't go into it because they're sometimes, uh, they, they don't work together. Uh, uh, they, they can go against one another. Uh, a work can be loyal to this and disloyal to that. Uh, and then there's a, a kind of a, a problematizing in between that. So I developed these axes uh, in light of uh, general assertions about translations found in some reviews. I, I don't have the time to go into them, uh, but what I will do is, uh, is uh, I, I wanna just take an example to, to show that the, the model works, uh, that the model is good for analysis of evaluation of uh, translations. Uh, and this is an example from uh, 2015, this, this dual notion of loyalty. Uh, so I'll, I'll read it out quickly. Um, the reviewer writes that the renewed Hebrew version, this is a, 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 a review written about the translation of Oscar Wilde. Uh, the renewed Hebrew version is a pleasure for language literature and the admirers of Wilde's work. Leah Nirgad, she's a translator. Excellent translation is worthy of praise. Wilde's voice emerges from each line clear and bright in the splendid Hebrew to which he was translated. So I'll just say uh, quickly that uh, this translation was review was positively evaluated for its loyalty to the source text. That's uh, Wilde's voice, and for its loyalty to the target language, uh, quote unquote, splendid Hebrew. Now, uh, let's move to integration. Uh, I, I wanna now spotlight a, uh, I'm going backwards. That's not good, I wanna go forwards. Okay, yes. So uh, I wanna spotlight a key change in the substance of the evaluation of translation between 55 and 2015, uh, markedly a change in the extent and ways in which reviewers write negative evaluations of translations. As you can see here, uh, there is a very sharp decrease, even sharper decrease than the one in general mentions of negative evaluations of translations. Uh, in other words, when translations are mentioned, uh, they're much more favorably evaluated in 2015 than in uh, 1955. Uh, you can see the numbers here in front of you. So on its own, this could imply many things, but when coupled with the content, uh, we get a more complete image of the change. Uh, uh, there's very salient moderation in the rhetoric employed by critics when negatively evaluating a translation. Uh, in 1955, many of the negative evaluations express a we, what I call a we point of view, uh, while the, trans the reviewers take the position of a gatekeeper protecting the Hebrew language and Hebrew readers from disloyal translations, while in 2015, uh, the rhetoric completely dissipated, giving way to this kind of individualistic first-person uh, literary-centric discourse uh, from the reviewers. Now, I'll give two examples of this. Um, this is a conclusion of a review written in 1955, uh, and, uh, and uh, the critic writes, uh, what trouble, the translation is very far from satisfactory. Lately, this dismal statement concludes many a review. Indeed, the time has come for something to be done about this. If someone truly cares about our country's language being tarnished and made into a laughingstock, I tried to translate this from Hebrew as, uh, as, uh, as sharply as I could, but I couldn't get through the, the, the venomous uh, tone uh, in, the, in the original Hebrew. Uh, translating tra text about translation is uh, always nice. So uh, I wanna point out three things about this uh, paragraph. The first is that the reviewer evaluates a translation of the work negatively. Yes, the translation is far from satisfactory. Then he further affirms the idea of a trend. He says, lately, this dismal statement concludes many a review. So this is the thing that is happening a lot. Uh, and thirdly, he goes on and he calls for action. Something must be done to stop these disloyal 
translations. Now, this is quite a radical statement uh, regarding uh, books, uh, literature, uh, at least uh, as I see it. Uh, but I want to argue here that the reviewer is calling for something to be done, not because these translations are bad literary products, uh, but because they tarnish the country's language, just, just as he writes, and make it into a laughingstock. In other words, because they are disloyal to the language, to the target language in this case, and as such disloyal to the nation state. Now, this is another example uh, for a review written in 2015. I don't have time to go over this, uh, but if you can, if you want to gloss over it quickly, uh, this is a clear example of a reviewer taking a very personal point of view. I didn't understand. I felt this. I felt that the book didn't work for me. The translation didn't work for me for this or another reason. Uh, so this is a, a, these two are good vignettes for the shift. Uh, finally, I, I argue that, that uh, I, want, I wish to suggest uh, more than argue that, uh, that we conceptualize the reviewers in this case as cultural gatekeepers. Yes, this is uh, very common in, in uh, literature. Uh, so maybe I offer that in this case, cultural gatekeeping is linked to the importance of certain products to the nation, to the national project. Uh, as Safran argues here, with the influx of refugees and immigrants that arrived to Israel in the state's early years came a quote-unquote potential threat of their languages with an emphasis on Yiddish to Hebrew. Hebrew was a project uh, in motion. Uh, it was part of the national project of the establishment of the state of Israel. Uh, and this project was under threat from uh, other languages uh, brought in by uh, immigrants coming to Israel in the country's early years. Uh, so this threat, Safran argues, was systematically fought by the country's political and cultural elite. And it seems to me uh, very easy to put uh, book reviewers into that uh, category of political and cultural elites. So I wish to argue that in a merely seven year old nation state with a national language under threat, uh, Hebrew translations of fiction disloyal to their target language were considered detrimental to the national project and thus of a transgressive nature. And that on the other hand, every work of literary fiction translated into Hebrew was an influential addition to the quote unquote collective bookshelf, which was still small and being built of works in the recently revived and now newly threatened language. So the translator's loyalty to the source, source text is also a question of loyalty to the budding Hebrew reader who probably didn't have any alternatives. I have a message in the chat. I guess that means I have two minutes. Yes, okay, I'm uh, wrapping up, I'm close. In other words, both axes of loyalty from the model that I offered uh, are coupled with loyalty to the nation state. Um, I do have another one, yes. Uh, so this is 1955. And if we zoom forward to 2015, uh, we can see that compared to the frail and threatened linguistic hegemony of Hebrew in 1955, Hebrew isn't threatened anymore, uh, not in any real sense in uh, modern day Israel. Uh, Safran writes this clearly, and uh, I, I think that, uh, that uh, I, I agree with him uh, about this. Uh, all other rival languages, Yiddish, Judeo, Arabic, Ladino, have been virtually erased among Hebrew speakers uh, in Israel. We have become to a great extent a monoglyphic uh, country. So I wish to argue that these discursive changes, these socio-historical changes are not only parallel to the changes in translation discourse, but they're intertwined uh, and interrelated. Uh, I, I wish to argue that this coupling of processes can also explain the relative decrease in translation discourse between 1955 and 2015. If issues of loyalty in translation and issues of loyalty in the national sense are intertwined, uh, then the cementing of the status of the language, which is the nexus of uh, movement between the systems of meaning uh, and the cementing of the status of the national project to which the nation was a mechanism of, uh, seems an acceptable explanation for the decreased engagement with translation in book reviews. Uh, to say this very clearly, and then I'll finish. Um, once the status of Hebrew was cemented, uh, the question of loyalty to the nation state, loyalty to the language became much less salient in discourse. And, and then parallel to that or, or intertwined with that became much less salient in questions of translation. Uh, so. That was my uh, shtick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Had. That was intriguing. And uh, wow, what a panel. 
Um, okay, so we had so many subjects and now my mind is going in four different directions. Um, but we will start with questions. So I think we have about five minutes for each speaker. Um, let's begin with you, Jessica. Um, could you again share just the first slide of your uh, presentation so we can remind ourselves uh, of your presentation? And then um, I'd be happy to take questions. You could either um, raise your hand or better so just write in the chat because um, I can't see everybody at once. But you know what? Yeah, if you can raise your hand electronically or just wave it and I'll see you, it will be great. Maura, please. You're muted. Maura, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Um, thank you all, first of all, for really fascinating presentations. Um, Jessica, you, you um, touched on this in your presentation, but I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more about Levantinism. It seems like it's really talking about um, an educated cosmopolitan population that's moved from one place to another and excludes so much of the population of the Levant, of the region. And um, so it seemed hard to, um, you know, talk about a particular Levantine character when so much of the population is actually not part of this educated elite. And I wondered if you could um, just elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so I think that, um... While uh, a lot of the conceptualization that has gone on previously has very much been at the hands of this elite, because who else has the time to be coming up with such concepts or has this insight of, oh, well, I migrated to the States, so now I have this uh, sense of perspective. I, I think that while that those have been the people who have been writing about this concept, that doesn't mean to say that the concept can't, can't be applied to other peoples. Um, and it's just about changing the space of the discourse from only being around ideas of uh, people who have had colonial educations or uh, who are part of a diaspora or so on. And, uh, we can begin to talk about, I mean, how uh, other, other people could be included into this conversation. I think there's definitely the scope for that. It's just something that hasn't yet made it out of uh, the world of academia and um, these people who have in history proudly called themselves Levantines and so on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Avery, I see you very quietly raising your hand. <laughs> yeah. I, I also have a question about Levantinism. It's a little open-ended, but do you think we could qualify Levantinism as really a post-trauma genre? It seems to me like a lot of the authors who are writing Levantine fiction are doing so after they've been displaced from somewhere or they've been removed from a nationalist mode of belonging. So I'm wondering if you think there is kind of a an inherent prerequisite that you have to have gone through something traumatic to try and attempt the Levantine genre. And maybe we could also put it close to diaspora literature in that way. Um, I think for sure, but I also think what really appealed to me in the first place uh, in using Levantinism is that it um, isn't as weighted as trauma studies or something like that, like that there's something beyond that as opposed to just sort of holding people down in their histories and what they've lived okay but these are real people living their daily lives and something I didn't have time to go into is very much in a lot of the fiction I've looked at it's very much about these daily details for example what does it mean to live your life in code switching where one sentence you say in Hebrew and the next you say in Arabic uh, or something like that and can we really reduce that to saying that this is talking about trauma uh, like the uh, Displacement, while it is difficult, is also inherently enriching. And even somebody like Edward Said, who's written about Orientalism and exile and so on, and has has stated clearly that exile is one of the worst things a person can go through, has also been known to say that like peregrination is the best part of my life. So I mm -hmm. I think that while it is 
it can't be detached from the trauma. It also tries to go beyond that and offer for people who are living today and who maybe also have inherited trauma, who are the generation after those who were displaced, what do they now do with this? Which I think is becoming globally a very big question, not just in the region. Okay, great. Thank you. I see Ohad has a question, but this should be quick because we should wrap this up in like two minutes. So Ohad, quick question and Jessica, quick answer. And I'll hold back because I have many questions, but we'll move on. Yes, Ohad. Uh, so um, I'm also enticed by this idea of Levantinization or, or Levantinism uh, also as an identity category uh, for myself uh, uh, in this very weird, uh, you know, uh, situation here in Israel. Uh, but, but my question is that, that to the same extent that I'm enticed by it, I, I see it as problematic, as you said, uh, mainly because I, 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 I'm not sure whether or not it's a utopian idea to think about Levantinism in this day and age. Uh, in the Middle East or in the Levant uh, or what have you. I mean, you have, as I said before, you know, Jews don't speak Arabic in Israel anymore. Uh, is, is, is this idea of being a Levantine in Israel even possible when we're completely bordered off? We can't move, it, we can't even move physically, geographically, like, uh, in, 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 the, in the region. Uh, we, we can't visit the Levant. We don't speak Arabic anymore. So I ask myself, is, is there a way in which uh, this is a uh, 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 an analytical category that we can work with today in, in, in a sense where I'm not sure we can be Levantines anymore. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I can exactly answer that question and certainly not quickly, but um, one thing that uh, actually came to mind in, when I was listening to your talk too is uh, uh, Shanhav Shahrabani, who has uh, translated a lot of the Arabic fiction I was looking at for my dissertation into Hebrew, he uh, believes that maybe were instead of three percent of Israelis able to speak Hebrew, uh, in, able to speak Arabic, instead twenty percent that there might actually be a cultural revolution. So while I don't want to jump at some kind of uh, utopic ideal, I do think that the very notion of having some frame in which to open up the discussions like, so that the Israeli and the Lebanese character who meet at the bar in New York can have a conversation about where they come from as opposed to avoiding this conversation. Uh, I think that there's something fruitful there uh, and it's not, doesn't have to be easy or straightforward, but there's something there. Wow, thank you. Okay, so as an Israeli, now I'm exploding with <laughs> questions and notions, but I am holding back. Uh, we will move on to Danila. Uh, Danila, can you please uh, show your first page of presentation? And we have uh, five minutes for questions to Danila. Just one second. So uh, while the presentation is coming up, if anybody will like to already raise their hand or write in the chat. Can you see it, yeah? No. We see it, yeah. And if I don't see any raised hand, I will... Oh, Maura, okay. Yes. Maura, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Daniela, um, again, my question is more for a clarification or elaboration. I think we usually think of the connection of American Jews to Israel um, and that being part of American Jewish identity post-1948, sort of like happening with the creation of the state of Israel. And um, your research seems to suggest that, that it created, it, it formed much earlier than that. Well, not much earlier, but formed earlier during the pre-state period, during the depression. And I wondered if you could uh, perhaps quickly just elaborate or explain that again. Uh, yeah, uh, in case of Israel identity or American Jewish identity, or in both. Well, how American Jewish identity, how how the fact of Israel or discourse about Israel mm -hmm. uh, affected, sort of helped American Jews uh, became part of their identity or claim a certain identity. How how that American Jewish identity was related to Israel. Oh, okay, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I guess that in 30s, uh, when the Israel was tossing between different strat strategies and conceptions, how they will simply survive, how they will treat, to whom they will apply, 
um, they um, connected with the USA. And uh, it happened because you know, this interconnection happened only because they were both on their forming stages. If, for example, a Jewish identity was formed, uh, the influence wasn't so big, couldn't be so big. And um, in case of uh, the USA, where this identity was also forming, and we can see it because of all, all the different tendencies that uh, we can see still in the diaspora in the USA. And um, um, so this interconnection, the, the significance of it, uh, the influence can be explained as for me. Uh, if we see that uh, while they were forming, they were like they need each other because uh, USA, uh, Jews in the USA, we can see it um, in different, uh, how they uh, write to their relatives, for example, in Eastern Europe, in Russia, in Poland, uh, they uh, tried also to find some help, find assistance, not because of, uh, not because of the problems that um, Jews in the uh, Middle East have, but because of their um, uh, problems like uh, increasing level of anti-Semitism, economic problems, political problems, how they uh, identify themselves, how they try to solve the problem of uh, getting, uh, of cutting all the ties with the diaspora. And um, they need each other, as for me, uh, the diaspora in the Middle East, further Israel, and diaspora in the USA. And this was the main factor why uh, they influenced on each other, because they like uh, meet together uh, on, on the territories of the USA and both in the Middle East. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Danila. Uh, unless there is any other question, we should move on. And again, I'm holding up, holding back my question because we're short of time. Um, okay, so we will move on to Sabrina. And uh, Sabrina talked about dance and Zionism, a uh, very unique subject, um, at least for me. Um, and I already see uh, Jessica's hands raised. So Jessica, please. Hi, um, I was just wondering whether you had any more specific thoughts on what it meant for the two performers in this piece to be women. Because uh, you talked a lot about different aspects of their identity, but uh, yeah, just that in particular, I wondered how, yeah, how you responded to it. To the both performance being women, you mean? in terms of their identity? Yes. Um, I think that both Shira and Hadar being women was was really important in the for them to be performing together as two Jewish women. Um, just because, so this is a little bit like I'm getting off topic from possessing, but when we talk to the performance, the performers um, through Zoom meeting, they did talk about the patriarchy and how them being women performing on stage, um, it negatively affected them or impacted them just because of um, the fact that they were nude. They did get Sexual, sexualized a lot. Um, they found their videos on websites that they did not consent to. Their bodies were just pretty much, I want to say, abused in a way um, without their consent. So I think that that was one of the, the things that I noticed about them being women in their performance, if that's what you're talking about. Thank you. Um, I also have a question. Um, um, you talk about protest against Zionism, um, and that really triggered a few questions in my mind. Um, first of all, in Israel, and speaking as an Israeli, um, even the most left-wing people that I, I know would not uh, define themselves as anti-Zionist. That's a very, very hard thing. Um, so I was wondering, why do you see this as a clear protest against Zionism? And also, why don't you talk about a religious protest? Because in Judaism, and these are both Jewish women, uh, the female body is not supposed to be exposed, you know, in this way. Um, so I was wondering, why do you see it? Why do you analyze it as an anti-Zionist um, dance and not as an anti-religious, anti-Jewish, or anti-other things? Um, so I saw it more as a Zionist movement 
because the nudity is not uncommon in contemporary dance in Israel. So they're not like ultra orthodox in that way. Um, but Zionism, the Shira and Hadar's main focus of the performance was them elevating um, Arab presence. They're pretty much trying to um, give a space where they talk about Zionism and its effects on on Arab on, on Arab presence in the territory. So it was more it was more necessarily about Zionism rather than um, than religious. Okay, so this you gather through the interview of them or through the analysis of the... Okay, I understand. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, okay, I was wondering. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're going a bit over time, but I hope it's fine with you. We will leave you like a five minutes break, but we really want to hear uh, questions to Ohad and translation. Ohad, can you put your slide on? And yeah, I see already. Jessica, is your hand raised again or is this from the previous question? Uh, it was from the previous question, but I do have a question. Okay. So, but if anybody else does, then. Does anybody else have a question? Let me quickly see. Uh, no, Jessica, go ahead. I think oh, Danila has a question. Who else raised their hand? Danila. Okay. So let, let Danila start because he didn't ask a question yet. And then Jessica, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, Ohad, you said that uh, this conception of we and I and how it changed. But don't you think that this uh, referred not only to different translations, but to different tendencies in culture, in culture itself? For example, we can remember how Palmach generation was criticized because of we, not of I, and uh, then uh, how uh, it was changed by Torah um, Medina uh, in 16 and 70s. And then, uh, for example, we can remember yeah, Garheld. And uh, don't you think that now this tendency uh, goes back to, to we, in case, for example, of uh, different modern writers like um, Meir Shalev, who writes still. So don't you think that this um, conception of we, not of I, uh, because of his books, and they're very famous as far as I know in Israel now, uh, and uh, he prefers conception of we, how he described in his books. So what do you think about this change in this conception? Yeah, uh, excellent question. Uh, I agree completely that the uh, that the change in perspective in, in the reviews is is concurrent with neoliberalization and and, and the rise of uh, individualistic discourse in Israel in general. You know, from this uh, idea of a uh, pioneering uh, collectivist society, all on a mission to create this uh, nation state in, in progress. To and I and I think that that these things are are all undercurrents that have to do with with the status of the national project. I mean, w w when the national project is cemented, then you don't have to have such a powerful we point of view. You 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 shift into a me point of view, and it, I think that has to do with all, all kinds of other cultural and discursive uh, uh, processes that happened uh, uh, concurrently. But but I, I completely agree with you that, that there are many many different ways in which this this shift uh, 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 diverges uh, with all kinds of different uh, processes. Definitely. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Uh, Jessica, I'm sorry we cannot proceed with your question because I was informed we have, have, have to finish the meeting right now and let you guys breathe before our next session. Uh, so uh, we look forward to see you in the next session. Thank you, everybody.